After getting married in 1924, H.P. Lovecraft moved from Providence to Brooklyn. Living in East New York, probably surrounded by black Americans and immigrants of all shades, Lovecraft writes as a coattail to horror at Red Hook. And as it turns out, it wasn't just a horror story. But for the people familiar with Lovecraft, even they'll admit that the horror at Red Hook read more like a metaphor for Lovecraft's own racial insecurities about his living situation in Brooklyn than it did a fictional horror story. And unfortunately, this is just who H.P. Lovecraft was. And if you stick with me through this review, that's what you're going to find out and more. But for right now, the song in the background you hear, Return of the Crooklyn Dodgers, is off Spike Lee's soundtrack for the 1996 film, Clockers. And it's the perfect soundtrack to the story of a cat from Providence who's an outsider trying to wrap his mind around a multicultural Brooklyn or a multicultural world for that matter. The song has rap legends who all hail from Brooklyn. So with that, I'm trying to reverse the curse and I couldn't think of a more appropriate track to do that with. So please support the works of these artists who make this all possible. Chub Rock, uh, OC, J. Rue the Damager, of course, Spike Lee, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever their merchandise is sold. I'll put links in the show notes. We did it like that, and now we do it like this. We did it like that, and now we do it like this. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, as many of you out there already know, even when we as black people are just trying to kick it, we can. We want to see a movie or Netflix and chill. But these folks out here making these movies have like zero chill. Just this year alone, let's just take it from the end of the year. In November 2019, right, Focus Features releases Harriet. Universal releases Queen and Slim. Both films face major backlash for the same thing. White savior narratives in freaking 2019 and not to be outdone next month in december orlando bloom finds himself fired from the hit showtime drama american gods because get this his performance sent the wrong message to black people so if that's not enough for you that following saturday after orlando bloom's fired west point cadets are broadcast live on national tv flashing a white power salute you know, but fortunately, ABC clears all this up and lets everyone else know, hey, they're just playing a circle game and not spewing hate on a national damn stage. So in the interest of not sending the wrong message to black people, welcome to my in-depth review of Bird Box, released Christmas 2018. It's been a year, but I've been looking into this for a while. Movies are memorabilia, and it's my sincere hope that some of you out there find value in where my curiosity led. To be honest, though, I'm not even really shocked at the racist cliches right off the top. The whole white survival on the condition of black sacrifice, that's pretty much par for the course for racist-ass Hollywood. But there was something else about that film that forced me to dig a little deeper, and that's what this review is going to get into. Bird Box was executively produced by Suzanne Baer and Sandra Bullock. Baer directed. Uh, the movie is based on a novel by a virtual unknown named Josh Mellerman. Mellerman, as far as I can tell, is new to the game. His credentials were only going back as far as 2014, according to Wikipedia anyway. Baer, on the other hand, had won an Oscar in 2011 for her work titled In a Better World. But my interest was in the source work for Bird Box. You know, I needed to know who was Josh Mellerman and how did he come up with this? And a Google search gave me answers faster than I could really appreciate. According to Dana Geek, the creatures of Bird Box are heavily influenced by the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft is one of the American fathers of sci-fi horror fiction. Lovecraft developed a dark style focused on abominable monsters that would come to be known as Lovecraftian. Many of the creatures that Gary seen here 
has drawn resemble the monsters of Lovecraftian lore, but none more so than the prominent drawing that Gary has displayed front and center. The weird little dude with tentacles on his face. And it just so happens that a tentacle face is one of the most frequently depicted features on Lovecraft's best-known monster, Cthulhu. Now, towards the end of the Den of Geek article, the writer, he walks it back a bit. He says, again, the creatures of Burbox aren't necessarily literally Cthulhu and the rest of his terrifying great old one companions the tentacles however are a dead giveaway that they're at least in part inspired by them and if their appearance wasn't enough the bird box creatures share one very important feature with the great old ones upon viewing cthulhu people are driven stark raving mad and of course if you've seen the film you get the reference there but the clues continue so i came across a usa today article titled Author Josh Merriman is more stoker than Lovecraft. And what's interesting about this one here is it was written four years prior to the release of the film. Right? So the USA Today reporter conducting this interview with Merriman would have only been able to read Merriman's book titled Bird Box. You know, he hadn't seen the film yet. And yet, just by reading Merriman's book alone, would leave such an impression of this writer of which I had never heard, he would begin his interview with Merriman like this. Spiegelman asked, what sends humans into madness seems to be getting a glimpse of something that our minds cannot comprehend. That is truly out of Lovecraft. Who are your other favorite horror writers? Merriman responds, the Mist by Stephen King was more or less my introduction to that Lovecraftian overlapping of dimensions. I like Lovecraft, but I don't know if I know him well enough to consider him a favorite. There are people who devote their lives to that guy. A whole shelf is grown in bookstores based on his stuff. Truth is, I love all the horror guys and girls. Cord Rollo, Shirley Jackson, Harlan Ellison, Ramsey Campbell, Dan Simmons, Thomas Ligotti. Each one of them brings something wonderfully different. And because I love the genre, I love those who love the genre too. And I hope the genre ends up loving me back. And I think yeah, blah, 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 blah. Okay. A couple of things about these two articles. Okay. Number one, both articles are describing Bird Box as being heavily influenced by this author. I barely ever heard of named H.P. Lovecraft. And the second thing that hops out at me is the USA Today article. And that's, you know, Mailerman's interview there is number one, it's showing me his familiarity with Lovecraft and that whole Lovecraftian lore. And it's also showing a barely detectable attempt at his part to kind of cover his tracks from Lovecraft by randomly name dropping like half a dozen authors of the genre, like out of the blue. I was born in New York and he's not going to get that past the kid. So let, let's pause here for a second for clarity. All right, look, this is not about if Merleman ripped off Lovecraft. As it turned out, I didn't need to know who Merleman was. I needed to know who H.P. Lovecraft was and where he was getting all of this. You know, now full of disclosure from my time working with Sophia Stewart, I learned something. And that is if you find yourself questioning someone's authenticity, don't judge them by their resume and their accolades. You judge them by their biography. You look at that instead. And it just so happens that the life of H.P. Lovecraft reads exactly like the type of nightmare scenarios that that man famously wrote about. When long ago the gods created Earth, in Jove's fair image, man was shaped at birth. The beasts for lesser parts were next designed. Yet were they too remote from humankind? To fill the gap and join the rest to man, the Olympian host conceived a clever plan. A beast they wrought in semi-human figure, filled it with vice and called the thing a nigger. On the creation of niggers, Written by a 22-year-old H.P. Lovecraft in 1912. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was born August 20th, 1890, to major early childhood trauma. He was raised by his mother and his grandfather. At about 14, his grandfather Whipple Van Buren Phillips, who was also a Mason, dies in 1904. Soon after, Lovecraft loses both parents due to mental health issues. 
The family home and business are lost due to mismanagement, and a young Lovecraft suffers a nervous breakdown before the age of 15. In February 1924, Lovecraft completes Imprisoned with the Pharaohs as a ghostwriter for Harry Houdini. That same year, he meets Sonia Green, and as I stated in the intro, get married in 1924, move to East New York, and two years later, get divorced. By 1928, Lovecraft returns to Providence, sinking into loneliness and frustration, and begins to write the vast majority of his famously known works. He had already written a horror at Red Hook, but out comes The Call of Cthulhu, The Case to Dexter Wars, uh, In the Mountains of Madness, The Myths of Cthulhu, and Coloring Out of Space. By 1937, Lovecraft's health was on a deep decline. He was forced into hospital care and ended up dying of intestinal cancer on March 15th of that year. Beasts with semi-human figures filled with vice and called niggers is honestly how Lovecraft saw blacks. Just not as mortal but spiritual enemies too. And his creativity, if you can even call it that, is just a punched up expression of racist instinct and white nationalism. And because Lovecraft was such a prolific writer, you know, no intelligent person can say he lacked the ability to express himself. I mean, the man wrote hella books. And instead of better characterizing or articulating or dealing with the real fucking problems he had growing up, he just resorted to projecting all of his faults on the black people and characterizing us as the source of his problems and society's problems. H.P. Lovecraft embodied the type of psychopathic racial personality Bobby Wright wrote about decades ago. And make no mistake, his no holds barred portrayal of all black people as brooding and evil was compulsive to say the least. And more disturbingly, his use of the occult ritual to perpetuate these kinds of values raises more questions and we'll get into that later. But the bottom line at this point is simple. When it comes to his legacy, Anti-black racism is the bonding agent of Lovecraft's entire catalog. But don't take my word for it. Peter Lavenda, author of the Dark Lord and the Sinister Forces series, gives us his take on the early life and overall worldview of an H.P. Lovecraft. And then I realized, studying Lovecraft, that his family history was really rather strange right there. And I began to look at ideas that maybe Lovecraft's upbringing had a much more direct impact on his fiction than we, we realize. His father had gone insane, mm. probably due to syphilis. Uh, he was a traveling salesman and, and something happened to him. His mind snapped and he died when Lovecraft was quite young. But then his mother began to develop all sorts of neuroses and psychoses. At one point she's wandering through the house and, you know, talking to unseen things behind walls and all of that. I mean, Lovecraft was living with this was living with basically characters from his fiction. Lovecraft didn't, you know, Lovecraft saw a whole different world. He saw that the world that had been the colonies of Great Britain and of Spain, Portugal, the United States, Netherlands, all these colonies had people that did not believe the way the Europeans did. And there were more of them. And they were rising up in protest and rising up against the colonial powers. When Lovecraft was writing, World War I had taken place. The Middle East was in chaos. Lots of parts of the world were in chaos. From my point of view, World War I never ended. We're still fighting World War I. It was just, you know, a calendar change, but it wasn't really anything else. We're still fighting those conflicts. And I think Lovecraft saw that as part of the problem. He thought that, you know, their belief systems, the quote-unquote other belief systems, were a threat to science, to technology, to you know, the Western way of life. And he gave voice to these concerns in his books with, with you know, in no uncertain way. I mean, you can actually sit there and, and read it from that perspective and read Lovecraft's works as a critique, you know, of the colonial peoples and of how we should, you know, support colonialism, basically, and keep everybody else down. So these things are interesting to me. They're fascinating. And if we take his stories and we update them to the 21st century, we can see how nothing much has changed as far as the basic themes are concerned just the names of the players may have changed and sometimes not even then but for the most part the themes remain the same mm -hmm. still not buying it okay 
For the skeptics out there who may think I'm reaching, let's take a quick look at the so-called creative genius of Lovecraft's Abominable Monsters. I've compiled a list here of a few that I was able to pull off the internet, uh, images that I took right from the Burbach film, some images I got from Google. So um, let's just run through the gambit. I too, this image is from Netflix, hailing from the Congo, described as a gelatinous mass with extruding tentacles. Uh, the black man, now this image is from Google, hailing from Salem and Arkham, described as a hairless man with pitch black skin and caucasoid features. The black man. Up next we have the black pharaoh. The black pharaoh hails from Egypt, appearing as a haughty Egyptian pharaoh. Next up, the black wind. The black wind. The black wind hails from Kenya, manifesting as a devastating storm. The black wind from Kenya. Um, anybody ever seen the color of wind? I don't. I just thought I'd ask. You know, because if the if the black wind comes from Kenya, then the, then the white wind come. Okay. Uh, next up, we have the dark one. Uh, the Dark One hails from the USA, appearing as a pitch black, faceless man. The Dark One from America appears as a pitch black, faceless man. Next we have the Faceless God. The Faceless God hails from ancient Egypt, appears as a winged, faceless sphinx. Uh, next up, Mr. Skin. Mr. Skin hails from Los Angeles appears as a faceless pimp a faceless pimp appearing in LA associated with the worshippers of my favorite the Shub Niggeroth oh just my favorite uh next up my favorite the Shub Niggeroth Shub Niggeroth described as a female black goat of the woods with a thousand young the Shub Niggeroth a female black goat of the woods with a thousand young. The Shub Niggeroth is like supposed to be like a black woman with a bunch of kids. I mean, it's, you know. Okay, and the last up, you got Nilar Hotep, hailing from ancient Egypt, described as swarthy, slender, and sinister. Um, you know, so if you get a white person to admit an African is a descendant of Egypt, he's going to be described as swarthy, slender, and sinister. Okay, look, this is his list, okay? This is just a handful of about eight or nine from the pantheon of Lovecraftian lore. And I think it's pretty obvious there's a thread here. The anti-black racism is either thinly veiled or ham-fisted. There's no in-between. So at this point, having read Lovecraft's history, I was just about satisfied with Bird Box being Hollywood's you know, cinematic version of a Confederate statue commemorating hate from like a bygone era. You know, but Mailerman's quote from that 2014 USA Today article still bugged me. Remember that Mailerman quote? He said, there are people who devote their lives to that guy. A whole shelf has grown in bookstores based on his stuff. You know, now I'm wondering if Mailerman himself is one of these people who devotes their lives to that guy. As I found out, entire corners of the internet had indeed grown based on Lovecraft stuff. I mean, hell, I saw a Cthulhu 2020 bumper sticker the other day, and I wouldn't have had a clue as to what that bumper sticker was referring to had I not looked into this godforsaken movie to understand how big the following was and how much impact it still has. And referring back to Lavenda, I found that he had written a short fictional book titled The Lovecraft Code. Now, what was a Lovecraft quote? Well, in short, it appears to have been a method of communicating by either venerating or furthering an occult ritual, right? You're communicating by either venerating or uh, showing a tribute to an occult ritual or you're furthering the ritual. This is what the Lovecraft quote was about. But, you know, my question immediately is why would Lovecraft, who was a devout atheist, revere such things why would an atheist pay tribute at all and 
pay tribute for what? And who would an atheist pay tribute to? At the same time, Lord Lovecraft was an atheist, a very committed atheist, someone who hated religion and who loved science and was uh, terribly devoted to scientific principles and looked down on superstition and looked down on religion. And yet here he is writing, you know, texts that would become some of the most uh, formidable explanations of the ancient alien theories and, you know, some of the original material that von Daniken and others after him would pick up. But Lovecraft is writing about this, about, you know, maybe there were people on this planet before us, maybe they're coming back, maybe there are people on the planet who can open a gate and let them in. All of these concepts Lovecraft is writing about with one hand, and on the other he's poo-pooing the entire thing, you know. There was a kind of a schizophrenia in Lovecraft's approach, it would seem to me. And this fascinated me, like, what's this all about? Is it possible, for instance, to be an atheist and still believe that there are you know, alien beings who are controlling the situation on our planet or had some major impact on our planet? Of course, the answer is yes. You don't have to believe in religion to believe in aliens, right? Mm-hmm. These things don't come from necessarily the same source. That's another subject for another day. But for Lovecraft, in his writing, he was identifying various cults that really did exist, like the Yazidi, for instance, and other groups, and tying them into this worldview that he had. And so I started to take a closer look, and when I did that, I realized that Kenneth Grant, the English magician, was doing the same thing, was connecting Lovecraft to Aleister Crowley and to ritual magic in general, using Lovecraft's characters and his themes as if they were real and exploring that possibility. And that was fascinating as well. Lavenda is suggesting that Lovecraft is paying tribute to Crowley's real-life ritual event by using very specific dates in his works of fiction, meant to pay homage to actual rituals once performed in real life. You creeped out yet? Lavenda continues. And then I realized that Grant seemed to have missed something in all of his work and all of his research on Crowley and on Lovecraft, and that is that Lovecraft's most famous story, the one I based the novel on, The Call of Cthulhu, is based on very specific names, dates, and places, right? Mm -hmm. Lovecraft is kind of unique in that. He really does insist that this is what happened on this day. He gives date, month, and year. I mean, he's, he's very explicit as to when things took place. And I find that also to be fascinating. So I started to deconstruct that. And that's when I discovered that, you know, Lovecraft's famous group of uh, worshippers of Cthulhu in the bayous and the swamps outside of New Orleans in Louisiana, this weird ritual took place on Halloween in 1907. And that date signified something to me. I mean, it jogged my memory, and I started going back over other material, and I realized that Aleister Crowley wrote his famous holy books on exactly that day. Mm -hmm on October 30, 31st, and November 1st, 1907. At the same time that cult was operating in New Orleans in Lovecraft's fantasy, one that he wrote 10 years after that, no more, almost 20 years later, Lovecraft is writing about this scene, and Crowley actually was living it. And in the holy books that Crowley was writing, he uses a lot of the same imagery that Lovecraft would later use in The Call of Cthulhu. And I, I would look at the two paragraphs like side by side what they were writing and it was stunning Mm. that Lovecraft was essentially channeling something that had happened to Crowley 20 years previously and of course I wrote The Dark Lord you know a nonfiction book based on comparing Lovecraft and Crowley and, and some and Grant and some of the other material. Kenneth Grant's book Outer Gateways draws parallels between Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos and the word Cthulhu which appears in Crowley's The Vision and the Voice. Also, an FYI, Kenneth Grant wasn't just some random researcher. Grant was actually Crowley's former personal secretary. Still not sold? Okay. Well, if Kenneth Grant and Peter Lavenda aren't good enough, according to Warlock Asylum International News, it's official. Lovecraft used the term Cthulhu as a code word for Crowley's Thelema. And here the fandom discussed the unlikely coincidence that Lovecraft's Cthulhu, which equals 93 in simple gematria, is referenced to Crowley's Thelema, which also equals 93 in gematria. The Warlock Asylum goes on. Fact number one, evidence proves that H.P. Lovecraft was an occultist. 
readers should avoid writers who make outlandish claims that Lovecraft was not. Yeah, in those very stories, the very texts that Crowley was writing in October 1907, the word Tutulu comes up. And even Crowley didn't know what that meant. He had no clue, but that word came to him with some intensity. And then, of course, like I say, 20 years later, Lovecraft is writing about Cthulhu. And the idea that the same kind of sounds, the same image was coming through in Lovecraft's dreams on the one hand and in Crowley's ritual workings and the trances that he was in on another. I mean, Crowley, Crowley wrote the Book of the Law, that seminal work of his religion, in pretty much the same kind of state. And then that was in 1904. So he's in this mode, Crowley. By 1907, he's now writing profusely all of this other material. And it's all kind of spooky and, you know, gothic in, in, its, in, in nature. And then in the midst of all of this, of black obelisks and everything else, very Lovecraftian imagery, comes the word Tutulu. And it's so similar to Cthulhu, you, you have to sit there and think, well, there, there's got to be, you know, uh, they're hearing something. They're hearing something legitimate. Now, before we go any further, let's recap. We found out the movie is basically a tribute to some unknown dude named H.P. Lovecraft. And a cursory glance of his work is mind-blowingly racist. And not only is the man a raging bigot, he's also a practicing occultist and fanboy of Aleister Crowley, who just so happens to be known as the wickedest man in the world. You know, so the question for me now is... Why would Lovecraft use occult references in the plain sight of his stories if he wasn't dabbling in the occult? We can come to understand this Lovecraft code involved duplicating a ritual performed by an actual occultist by mirroring the ritual in a work of fiction. This is what Lovecraft was doing with Crowley. Um, and while Burbox may not have had anything to do, at least directly, with an occultist named Crowley, it had something to do with another occultist who just so happened to hate black people. Charles Manson represents for me the, um, the icon, if you will, uh, of all of these forces and how they come together. And for some reason, we tend to build our prisons and our military installations on those sites that were the most prominent uh, sites of the ancient civilizations. Every time you find a, a series of Indian burial mounds of any size, for some reason there's a penitentiary, a, a prison across the street or on top of it, or a military base, or in some cases a, a nuclear waste facility. And I always think to myself that these represent the most um, tense uh, human habitations, military bases and prisons. And for some reason, we choose those, uh, we choose to build them on the side of Indian burial mounds. So there is a, an unconscious realization of this in our filmmakers. For instance, uh, in The Shining, uh, the, the famous Stephen King novel, mm -hmm. the Overlook Hotel is supposedly built on the site of an Indian burial mound. Yeah. In the movie Poltergeist, they're building housing tracks on the sites of Indian burial mounds. Uh, in the movie Identity that came out a couple of years ago, there are references to Indian burial mounds at the site of that famous motel where all of these murders are taking place. So it seems as though in Hollywood, we seem to have this unconscious understanding that there's a connection between these burial mounds and some very strange supernatural phenomenon. And mm -hmm. Lovecraft wrote about this in the 1920s yeah. by saying that the artists would be the first ones to know what was going on and how the, these forces were coming into play in, in, our, in our life, in our consciousness. Now, what did Charles Manson have to do with Bird Box, you wonder? Don't take my word for it. I'll let the actors tell it. You guys are kind of all... Tr I don't want to give too much away. The fun of watching the movie is not knowing what is next. But I can say that you guys are, for the most part, trapped in a house together for a, a large part of the film. Uh, a number of great actors outside of you guys are in that house as well. You have John Malkovich, you have Sandy B. Uh, what was it like... They, see, <laughs> uh, what was it like shooting all of those scenes together? Was that... Even though they're tense scenes, were you guys all having a good time hanging out in this house? I think for the most part, um, it, it was both, right? Because it, it felt like we was really in this. Because, I mean, the, the house was really taped up. You couldn't see. I, I didn't, you don't know what the weather is outside. You don't know if it's still sunny outside. You don't know if it's nighttime yet. Even when we took our breaks, it was still in that house. 
<laughs> so were you guys in a real house or was it a studio? No, we were in a real house and it was eerily it's haunted. similar. Actually. Yeah, 100% yeah. haunted. Yeah. It yeah. has a cool story John behind it. Manson. Yeah, yeah, he stayed there for a bit, so we were all feeling oh, it's it. It's one of the it's, it's yeah. one of the houses and that he, he lived. died while we were shooting it, so then it felt extra creepy. And then there were fires while we were shooting. There was ash falling outside, and we had some like weird moments on set, right? Yeah. They were creepy. It was, you know, it, was man. it was pictures I, of a real uh, real quick. It was a picture of a guy. <laughs> pictures of this guy growing up, like from when he was a little kid, and he went to college with his friends. The guy who owned the house. I don't know who this dude is. It was like a little room. And it was really, it was really, I got really fascinated. It was weird. Machine Gun Kelly opened up about his character Felix and revealed the whole cast shot in Charles Manson's former house. Kelly goes on. Wild fact about the house we shot in is that Charles Manson used to stay there right before he committed the murders. The director made us all, Sandra Bullock included, sit in one room together all day until it was time to shoot. It really made us go a little crazy and bonded us at the same time which is what happens in the film. After having said all that, knowing how racist Lovecraft was, and knowing how much he still secretly admired in Hollywood, and after having heard authors and journalists on the topic of Lovecraft code, I think it's fair to seriously question the origin and sources of films like Bird Box. If Bird Box wasn't paying tribute to occult rituals by intentionally mirroring aspects of the rituals inside their works of fiction like Lovecraft did with Crowley then why shoot a movie in Charles Manson's house? I think that's a fair question. And let's not forget you know wherever you find the white bigots Jay-Z and Kanye ain't too far behind. You know apparently they knew who Lovecraft was too but they didn't share this with us. You know all jokes aside oh, what what does this what does this all mean? Prior to the film's release in December of 2018, NBC reported that black Americans had been the most frequent victims of hate crimes in every tally of bias incidents generated since the feds began collecting data in the early 90s. But a film like Bird Box was still released as of December 2018 without disclaimer, hesitation, or apology. So all things considered, it's a fair question now to ask, is ritual magic being used as a means to maintain white supremacy? I think that's a fair question too. A question with which the black audience may have to contend sooner than later. Bottom line is, Lovecraft's so-called creativity was really derived from deep-seated animosity and hatred towards blacks specifically, as well as other non-whites. Lovecraft's bigotry masqueraded as creativity, and it's still celebrated today. Racism was the code that Lovecraft lived by, that is, until it killed him. Please like, share, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Peace. Kids are so trained. The metaphor sets from my brain to my jaw. It comes from other places, not the tinted faces. Journalists, the 